Hello and welcome to the Seaweed Sofa, where we sit down with some of the most interesting participants at the World Water Week to learn more about the array of water-related issues being discussed this week in Stockholm. My name is Eric Bagley, a host of the Seaweed Sofa, and the name of this session is Mountains, Glaciers, and Hydropower in a Changing Climate, Insights from the Himalayas. It's a session convened by ISIMOD, and joining me, we, joining me we have three uh, representatives from this organization. We have Dr. David Molden, the Director General of the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development. We have Dr. Eklabia Sharma, uh, Director of Program Operations at ISIMOD, and Dr. Aditi Mukherjee, the uh, Theme Leader of Water and Air at ISIMOD. Welcome all to the Siwi Sofa. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Very nice to have you here. And, um, Perhaps we could start by um, discussing the importance of the Himalayas and the overall water situation and water supply uh, generation in Asia. Sometimes they're referred to as the water towers of Asia. Is that an accurate uh, description? Indeed it is. The, the Himalayas cover, I our region covers eight different countries, right? Stretching from Afghanistan clear to Myanmar, and people don't think of Myanmar having glaciers and mountains, but it's true. So we have Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, China, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh and Myanmar as our member countries looking at the mountains and the hills. Uh, the region has more, s the outside of the North Pole and South Pole, it has uh, more snow and ice than any other region on Earth. And sometimes it's called the Third Pole region for that name. Uh, but also starting from the mountain areas are 10 major river basins. Right, coming off the, in, it, for example, the Indus, the Ganges, the Brahmaputra, the Yellow, Yangtze, Mekong rivers, to name a few of them, come from this uh, mountain areas. So we have about 200 million people living in those mountains. That's already a lot, but about 1.3 billion people living downstream depending on mountain resources. So it's an incredibly uh, important resource base, yes, for water resources, obviously, uh, but other factors as well. For example, there's huge potential for hydropower development, the potential energy in this region. Uh, there's also um, huge biodiversity and agricultural biodiversity in the region. And of course, the people themselves in the region are incredibly diverse, uh, incredibly adaptable and resilient, something we can all learn from, from these uh, mountain people. Our motto at Isimod is then for mountains and people. In other words, we deal with mountain environments and mountain people. It's an area that uh, when we think about climate change is under threat. It's highly vulnerable to climate change. Uh, the people in the mountains are not the ones emitting the greenhouse gases, but in a way they're already paying the price for climate change as we're moving ahead. Uh, some of the issues we see are melting snow, melting ice, melting permafrost in the region, but also changes in rainfall patterns that, that will make a big difference in this area. And we see a lot more uh, hazards, say landslides, uh, in, in the area that's partly in part uh, from climate change as well. Uh, so it's an area that we really have to pay attention to and, and I would say I was really happy uh, with Stockholm Water Week that did put mountains on the agenda this time. It's actually not a topic that's very often discussed at these Water Week meetings. And one of the, uh, the main themes of uh, this uh, session here is the, uh, the uh, Hindu Kush Himalayas in particular. And of course, climate change is happening all over the world uh, in the Himalayas and elsewhere. But why, why is this particular uh, region so uh, crucial when it comes to climate change? Well, they, so I, I would, it, it uh, surely is one of the most vulnerable regions to climate change. And then we, we already think about the melting glaciers, right? To the, and, and the impacts on the water resources downstream uh, for mountain people in those downstreams are, are quite, uh, quite serious. Uh, it's also the, a place where you see a lot of uh, migration of people out of the mountains areas uh, and that part of that is just the difficult climate and environment and other opportunities elsewhere but it uh, it is that migration that we're concerned about if you think about the energy and produced from the uh, water resources in the mountains it's incredibly important for the asia region but by extension uh, very important for the global community as well to take care of this resource base the himalayas I mean, melting glaciers are, are uh, sort of an icon of climate change uh, around the yeah. world uh, in the Himalayas and elsewhere. 
Um, how will this affect the region in over the next 30 to 50 years, the, the, uh, the ecologies and the, the societies in the, the greater Hindu Kush uh, Himalaya region? And I put that out to, to all members of the panel, if anyone yeah. would like to weigh in. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, the, I think uh, wha one issue that I just wanted to point out, we have climate change, but that climate change is on top of all kinds of other changes that are happening in the region. So, for example, the migration of people out of mountains, the globalization, the increased connectivity of people. So we're seeing more and more roads. I was in an isolated area in the mountains. I thought people were putting in water cables, but it was actually fiber optic cables connecting <laughs> China with people in Nepal. So the region is changing rapidly with a lot of challenges. On top of that is climate change. So it's an it's a issue that's compounding many challenges that we face in the region. But maybe others would like to come yes, in. Yes, uh, I think climate change has brought a lot of consciousness and awareness among the countries. And they understand climate change is not a particular country's uh, problem. It's a country, uh, problem of all the countries. So they are seeing more and more value of cooperation between the uh, countries. So we see lots of risks, challenges, threats uh, because of climate change, but it has also provided opportunities for the countries to cooperate. And now you can see countries like India, China, they are coming up with lots of uh, uh, projects and opportunities for uh, cooperating in this uh, region. So I see uh, very much there is uh, uh, some uh, positive movement uh, to address climate change uh, in, the, uh, in the region, both in uh, perspective of policies as well as something on the ground. So its action on the ground is very, very important. For instance, in case of uh, India, they have very much established um, uh, uh, one of the mission called Sustaining Himalayan Ecosystems. So where all mountain states and national different uh, missions are coming together to address the issues of the Himalayan region. And in that mission, very clearly, they also talk about they need to cooperate with the neighboring countries. So uh, in that context, the only institution, which is the uh, ISIMOD, uh, the International Center Intergovernmental Organization, has that mandate. And it really gives us a uh, lot of ownership and opportunity for us to work. So I see lots of good uh, uh, opportunities for addressing the issues of climate change and the type of uh, uh, other drivers which are equally important uh, because they uh, contribute also to the changes of um, uh, in the region. So uh, I would see land use, land cover change. Urbanization within the mountains itself. Huh? So it is uh, now uh, act actually asking for more uh, resources and more uh, better planning. So we see many, many uh, drivers, but there are uh, also drivers like globalization, which has now brought lots of these digital services, which are actually <laughs> can be achieved in anywhere in the mountains. So uh, I would see, uh, I think uh, as we move uh, uh, forward, there are opportunities of cooperation between the communities from one country to the other countries, private sectors coming in a big way. Uh, in my opinion, you can take example of travel uh, tourism, where a number of country travel agencies are cooperating uh, and actually uh, in these mountain uh, systems. So uh, I think uh, we have to take that uh, opportunity to really address the issues of uh, climate change. Most importantly, I think uh, the policies. Uh, uh, we have global agreements and how we are going to implement those uh, in the region are going to be critical and how complementary policies are made between the countries to address the climate uh, issues in the mountains. Addressing uh, related to that is quite uh, important. Finally, I think data is very important. Information is important. Uh, that has uh, provides the evidences for good policy making. And ECMOD has actually started working very much to generate uh, data information uh, in uh, better quality data, consistent, comparable, uh, representing the region, I think these are quite uh, important. And those evidences and data information then finally can be used in proper designing, planning, and policy uh, processes in the countries. Um, I wanted to uh, give some concrete examples of not only climate change, but also some of the other socioeconomic changes that we are talking about, say urbanization, male-specific out-migration, on livelihoods of the people at the very local level. 
One of the examples is um, Nepal and India and many of the mountain countries have had centuries old farmer managed irrigation systems which had very integrate and robust rules for various kinds of you know how to manage those irrigation systems. One of the impacts of male specific out migration has been that the uh, water rights are still with the male household heads while increasingly women are managing those irrigation systems. So, so there is a kind of a vacuum a void of what happens when your, uh, your male irrigators go out but the women are forced to manage those systems. So, we find uh, because they do not have commensurate rights to those irrigation systems many of those are actually declining and that decline is actually exacerbated by many of the extreme climate events even even the even earthquake last year destroyed many of these uh, farmer managed irrigation scheme another important water related issue that is emerging a lot and which is also at the intersection of both climate change as well as socioeconomic changes is that of drying up of springs in the mid hills springs are uh, absolutely the most important source of water for for people there and uh, and things like haphazard unplanned infrastructure construction be it uh, roads be it hydropower without proper planning and understanding has been disrupting these springs and much of the of the brunt of this excess work actually falls on the woman. So, when we talk of climate change, I think understanding that the impacts of climate change are not equally shared amongst everyone is also very important to remember that women often are at the receiving end of climate change uh, phenomena. Another effect of climate change that's being discussed is the impact on uh, the development of hydropower potential in the region. Um, how can these challenges be mitigated so that the region can actually uh, utilize the uh, potential of the, uh, the water resources that way? Yeah. What we uh, talked a lot about in our last section was the risk, the, the risk to, say, hydropower investment. And, and I th the hydropower companies are increasingly concerned about a, a number of risks. But I think the first step, there's still very much potential to, to get that power generated, but a first step is to understand those risks. So a, a first kind of risk is the changes in the hydrology, the changes in water resources that comes from the glacier melt. And it was uh, curious in the session that uh, you know, while glaciers are melting, it actually brings down more water in the rivers for a short time, and then later the glacial contribution gets less to the river systems. And uh, some of the climate models are predicting more rainfall in the future. So that might compensate the hydropower companies. But uh, other kinds, uh, so, I, so there's a need to do that assessment for hydropower companies to see if they can invest. The other kind of kinds of risk we were exploring were, say, around disasters, right? Because uh, the area is uh, vulnerable to uh, what we call glacier lake outburst floods, where the water from the glacier melts and forms a lake that might drain and cause uh, damage to hydropower. Now, it's possible in the designs to mitigate that risk as well. And then another kind of risk is just a societal risk, the perceptions of people uh, about hydropower. You know, is it do, does the hydropower d uh, benefit local communities or not? So we had a really interesting discussion on benefit sharing and how to reduce that, that perception risk uh, from hydropower as well. Mm. Maybe, uh, Benefit sharing at the local level is very important. Uh, and the reason is because uh, actually if communities perceive that they are not going to receive commensurate benefits from hydropower, they have enough political power to stop construction or to, uh, or to obstruct you know, um, operation of those, uh, of those hydropower plants. So, um, uh, I think uh, while many of the hydropower companies would pay a lot more attention to the hydrological risks, I think they have to pay equal attention to the risk of societal discontent. And for that, uh, we find in Nepal and India, where we have done some studies, that the government and the hydropower companies have uh, been providing certain kind of benefits. But those benefits work best when the benefits go directly to the community instead of going to a very big central fund, and then the government redistributes it. So direct 
contribution from the hydropower projects directly to the community, say to so the village development funds or to building roads or infrastructure for the villages or giving uh, equity shares in the hydropower projects for the communities works much better than, uh, than another model where the hydropower company directly pays to the government and that then it is expected that the benefits would trickle down to the communities. There's also expected to be quite a few um, impacts on the biodiversity of the uh, of the region yeah. due to climate change. Uh, have you mapped those at all? What do, what do you expect will be the uh, consequences? Yes, I think this is a very important topic. If you see globally, there are 34 global hotspots. Out of 34, four hotspots are the in the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. And uh, we have uh, very clearly seen that climate change impact uh, uh, on the biodiversity is uh, uh, very clear. Uh, we have seen in case of oak forest, change of one degree uh, temperature rise actually wipes out in sudden zone uh, the oak forest. When we say oak, then it is uh, also uh, harboring, providing habitat for other species to foster. So we see uh, lots of uh, change that is already uh, happening in the region. We also see that as temperature is rising, the species range is shifting from lower elevation actually they are moving upwards and those species which are already very much high uh, in the uh, elevation they are likely to be disappearing uh, in future and some of them uh, are uh, also disappearing so climate change with the uh, uh, other uh, type of stresses i would say are combined the uh, impact uh, on some of the species, especially the high altitude species. And when you see the Hindu Kush Himalayan region, you can actually uh, see and categorize where is the maximum threat. The timber line, we uh, call it, the species they have and the trees goes to a sudden level and after that there is no trees uh, anymore. That is the most fragile. Um, uh, region for uh, climate change impact on species and many valuable species like medicinal aromatic plants uh, grow there. One good example uh, of that uh, elevation is Yarsa Gomba, we call it Cordyceps, the Himalayan gold we call it. The value of that particular caterpillar plant, uh, fungus, uh, is as much as sometimes 70 to 80 thousand dollar for kilogram. So it's a huge resource and there is uh, really an impact uh, on uh, such elevations with such uh, resources. So biodiversities are uh, really uh, threatened. So this is one type of livelihood linked biodiversity. Then you can also see those species which are globally very, very important, umbrella species like snow leopards. We have many, many other uh, species. So their habitat is also uh, either getting fragmented or they are getting squeezed. These animals also move. They have a wide range from one mountain region to another mountain region. So if the climate change is impacting uh, certain areas, the movement of these animals uh, horizontally as well as vertically are affected. So in that uh, context, I think biodiversity uh, is uh, being impacted quite uh, a lot. Uh, in high altitude areas, one of the uh, major changes that we see is on wetlands and we have uh, wetlands uh, which are glass, glacial fed uh, wetlands and we have wetlands which are not uh, glacial fed. We already see that some of the wetlands are shrinking but those uh, wetlands which are linked with the glaciers actually they are expanding. So the biodiversity which is actually related to these wetlands, aquatic biodiversity, we see that because of warming the species uh, composition uh, uh, is also changing. The other threat that we have seen uh, from climate change in terms of biodiversity is invasive species. Uh, many alien species are actually coming uh, and uh, they are uh, actually dominating uh, and removing the more useful species, especially in high altitude rangelands where we have yaks, we have many uh, different types of cattle and livelihood is very strongly linked. So their species composi composition is changing. Uh, and then these Im invasive species are actually uh, impacting uh, very much on the quality of fodder, quality of resource for the uh, livestock and it is also related to production. So we can see lots of 
uh, impact already happening in uh, biodiversity. I can tell you, I mean, uh, there is so much of phenological changes also. Because of milder winter, we already see that some of our peaches, they are uh, flowering in non-season uh, situation, which is normally has to flower in April, uh, but you can see flower and fruits already in December. So we have seen such phenological changes uh, actually happening and that is also uh, impacting on production of some uh, good um, uh, crops which are related to uh, that region. Uh, one of the uh, major impacts that I see in terms of uh, species uh, in that region is that um, uh, more and more uh, we are seeing diversity is becoming less in those areas where people are also uh, uh, having uh, habitation near uh, those areas. So the effort from the countries are that more areas are under put under mm, uh, protected area management. And to link with the people, there is a good man in the biosphere program has come with biosphere reserves where there are areas where people can interact, like tourism can interact in nature, very nice areas. So there are areas which are uh, designated for doing tourism. So in the context of these challenges, there are uh, also some of the possibilities where uh, we can address these uh, issues. So uh, now uh, we know about the climate change. So from our institution point of view, ISIMOD has a transboundary landscape management program across all the Hindu Kush uh, Himalayan region. We have six transboundary landscapes covering seven countries uh, out of eight countries of ISIMOD already engaged in transboundary landscape management and sometimes when we do transboundary landscape management it is a holistic uh, integrated ecosystem based approach where we try to address water as well as biodiversity and the aspirations of people in terms of their livelihoods together so uh, we see uh, these uh, efforts which has come mm, from ISIMOD in ecosystem management, addressing livelihoods of the people uh, from uh, biodiversity and uh, agriculture, and then uh, also trying to see the change over the years. We have a long-term uh, social and ecological monitoring systems uh, framework that we have developed, and in each of these landscapes, we are trying to work with the partners to have uh, such systems to generate data and information which can then provide evidence and uh, support to the national policy as well as design of programs. So uh, definitely I think uh, the biodiversity being a very important um, uh, natural uh, element of uh, the Hindu Kush Himalayan re region needs special attention. I mean, given all these uh, range of changes that are well underway at this point, how do you see the future of the region over the next 30 to 50 years? And uh, what changes do you think are required for making the region's growth sustainable? You know, you know I think the way to do this is to, to look at the future and see, uh, see a future where people are taking ad, uh, advantage of the mountain resources. This is a tremendous resource base and as far as the water, the energy. So we can see uh, in the future uh, a place where human well-being, human health, human happiness is very much improved by balancing the conservation of those resources with the development. Now, that's the way we have to look at the future, right? A prosperous region and the resources are maintained. <coughs> the question is how to get there, what steps to be taken. Now, one piece of the, we have this mountain region that's shared by eight countries, right? So one of the big steps is uh, cooperation between the countries to manage that shared resource better. Now, we have seen uh, recently, and actually uh, with climate change, this has come up as something positive, that countries are concerned very much about their mountain resources. They want to learn from each other what's going on what's happening with the glaciers, what's happening with biodiversity. So actually that offers an opportunity where the countries together can learn how to manage the resources better. And we actually do see that happening. So a very positive uh, move in that direction. Then also there's uh, steps now, our people are learning how to manage, for example, hydropower better. How can countries exchange knowledge about, say, benefit sharing, how the people can um, can do better with hydropower. Then uh, 
with, yes, there's a lot of mountain risks, a lot of mountain changes, but there are also very much opportunities with high-valued mountain products. Uh, for example, the, the uh, herbs you were talking about. Even with climate change, you can grow orange uh, apples up hi at higher elevations. So somehow people have to uh, get linked with the market that's happening with globalization. So the idea is to turn those risks, to turn the challenges into opportunities to see that world 30 years from now, 50 years from now, where a place where, yes, uh, people are coming back to enjoy the mountains and to prosper in mountainous areas. So there are um, at least a uh, couple of things that we should completely avoid in the mountains. One is um, not really go for fossil fuel development. So there has to be a lot of uh, emphasis on development of renewable energy. And uh, mountains have this advantage vis-a-vis -vis hydropower. So that I see as an as a important um, way going forward. And another interesting thing about these eight countries is that um, when you talk about water and energy, all of them have uh, a like um, all of them have high hydropower potential, and uh, they also have um, different kind of energy mix. Some countries like India and China have more of thermal. You know, other countries like Nepal and Bhutan are on hydropower, and their requirements are also different. The peakedness of demand is different. In the colder countries, in the mountain countries uh, like Bhutan and Nepal and Afghanistan, you need more energy during the winter for heating purposes, while in the more warmer countries countries you need more energy during the summer for irrigation and cooling purposes. So, uh, so that kind of offers a very good opportunity for regional cooperation around energy issues. So if, if, if that happens, and there are a lot of indications that uh, now the energy treaties are going beyond bilateral to more multilateral uh, levels, so that, is, uh, that would be one positive change that can entirely change the face of the region. So at the heart of it is really transboundary cooperation of the countries having to work together. The other thing I see is um, migration is often uh, painted as something negative, but that ne need not necessarily be so. What's also happening is with all the with the all the out migration, a lot of remittance money is coming in, and a lot of them get invested in in positive things. For example, a lot of it gets invested in improving agricultural practices or for starting some kind of you know sustainable agri business. So so that is the second, and the third one would be uh, improvements in information and technology. That also would change the face of the mountain in the next uh, 30, 50 years. Uh, I think uh, when I look uh, into the mountains, one of the uh, things that we have to really see is how we can retain the youths in the mountains. What are the opportunities for the uh, youth in terms of uh, their engagement, their employment in the mountains? If we address that uh, issue, I think uh, the mountains has uh, have a bright future. The regional cooperation was mentioned uh, by both of my colleagues uh, and there I would see the uh, next 20 to 50 years time there has to be a free movement uh, of people in the region like the European Union you have that similar and for our region if we have that situation I think there are uh, much more win-win situation uh, uh, for the region in my uh, opinion so a uh, number of uh, uh, opportunities uh, which we see right now are all transboundary we have to grow as one uh, region then only I think the benefits can uh, really come. High value products, which was mentioned by uh, Dr. Malden, uh, I it is uh, coming from Nepal, but it has to go to India or China to really get its market huh, or international uh, flow. So similarly, uh, we have lots of strengths in Nepal, which others don't have. For instance, community forestry is a very uh, important uh, uh, management approach which Nepal has evolved, devolved uh, also. And that example can go to other countries where we lack that type of uh, opportunity. So it's learning uh, very much at the community level, at the uh, institution level, at the national between the government level with more free movement in terms of uh, uh, the exchange uh, that will provide lots of opportunity. I think the region has a um, uh, lot of potential, but there has been very little investment going to the mountains. So in future, if mountains receive the investment for organic farming, 
green growth uh, approach so that we retain the environmental sustainability uh, ecosystem services from the mountains and still the region can uh, bring uh, lots of economic development for the people in the mountains as well as the for the people who are living in downstream it was mentioned 1.3 billion people live uh, in the downstreams if the mountains are good 1.3 bi uh, 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 billion people will uh, also have a good situation. If mountains suffer, those people will also suffer. There will be uh, very uh, more floods. There will be less water for irrigation. So uh, food security will be impacted. So we have to see very holistically. The region has to see, the countries have to see it as a holistic. And ISIMOD is, uh, of course, there to really make that happen uh, with good uh, data, good information, good evi evidence, we convene uh, the countries together to discuss on these issues. So I see there is a bright future for that region. And I think everybody has to own it. And, and, <coughs> and surely the, the focus on water at this conference has an opportunity to, I mean, it is a way to unlock many of these opportunities. Use water for the high-valued products, create some business opportunity for young people, is a, is a way to move forward. L reduce the risks from water development, pay attention to that, is an opportunity for investments to take place uh, in mountain areas. And um, so I, I believe the water community should also pay a lot of attention to what happens for mountains for the sake of mountains, but also for Asia downstream, our region and the globe. Well, I'd like to thank you all for a very interesting conversation of a, on a fascinating region in flux, a very critical, important to region, not just for the region itself, but for the greater uh, Asian region. So thanks for joining us here in the CV Sofa. Good. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. And thanks for tuning in to the CV Sofa. Stay tuned throughout the World Water Week for more episodes.